There goes Davis. Oh, my gosh. Davis is going to run it all the way Here back. Here comes pressure. Bortles sees it coming. Looking for Wharton in the end zone. Wharton behind the defense. Oh! Are you kidding? <laughs> Carolina on a beautiful day for the spring game. And now time for the National Anthem. Couldn't ask for a better day for this South Carolina Garnet and Black game. Last year, 35,000 came, and they're expecting another good crowd today on a perfect day with the temperature and below 80s. Fan Fest outside of the stadium. Folks are piling in here a couple hours before for all these festivities in front of this spring game. Back inside williams Bryce Stadium here in Columbia. And it's one of the great entrances in all of college football to get us going with this 2014 Garnet and Black game. This is the SEC on ESPN. williams Bryce Stadium on a Saturday afternoon in the spring, but a bit of a taste of the fall in here, getting ready for the Garnet and Black game. And we say welcome inside the broadcast booth with former George All-American Matt Stinchcomb, Joe Davis, Maria Taylor joins us down in the field in just a moment. Before three years ago, South Carolina had won double-figure games once in program history, but now three straight 11-win seasons, three straight top 10 finishes. This is the golden age of Gamecock football. No argument there. Absolutely, when you look at the expectations for what should come out of this football program, they're incredibly high given the accomplishments that have been undertaken under Steve Spurrier. He's brought in great players. He's put together great squads. No longer the singular seasons of achievement. They're stringing together consecutive years, and it's the consistency of excellence that has vaulted them into the upper echelon of the SEC. And our focus today will be moving forward, but before we do that, let's look back at what they say is probably the best season in program history. They finished number four in the final polls. Those two losses to Georgia and to Tennessee. You'll never forget this one if you're from around these parts. They trailed 17-0, and then came from behind to beat Missouri. And, of course, anytime you can beat Clemson five times in a row, it's going to have four Folks around here happy about it. They capped off the season with a third consecutive bowl win and the 2014 Capital One Bowl over Wisconsin in Connor Shaw's final game. So they finished ninth in the BCS standings, but number four overall for that top five finish and a third straight 11 win season is school record. You saw Connor Shaw will, of course, have to replace him, and they're going to try and do it with Dylan Thompson. You know, they lose to Davian Clowney, maybe the most talented player in college football, but the most valuable player to the Gamecocks was at the quarterback position in Connor Shaw. Shaw. 
Dylan Thompson is able and capable of taking over for Connor Shaw, and it's because of what Steve Spurrier does with his quarterbacks. He always has a well-apprenticed backup ready to go, locked and loaded to insert into his offense. Dylan Thompson already with a bowl victory. He's got a victory over Clemson in 2012, a rivalry game. He is able to step in as a senior and take the reins of this offense. Maria Taylor is down in the field with Steve Spurrier. Coach, we all know that Dylan Thompson's a very reliable backup, but what do you expect to see from him first spring on top of the depth chart? Uh, Maria, we hope he hits a whole bunch of passes and scores one or two touchdowns, and then we'll let the other guys play. Uh, but Dylan, he's going into his fifth year. He's played about three full games since he's been here, so he hadn't played quite a lot yet. So just give him a little playing time, but we think he's got a chance to really be an outstanding player. What were some of your points of emphasis for him in spring practices this year? Yeah, basically just get the ball out of your hand quickly. Uh, sometimes he has a tendency to run a little bit more than we like. Now, Connor Shaw was an excellent runner, and Dylan's pretty good. Uh, but I think he's a little bit more stay in the pocket and, and throw the ball tight quarterback. Well, everyone wants to know who's going to be the celebrity receiver in your famous trick play. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, a guess now. We, we're keeping it quiet. Uh, it'll happen right near the end of the second quarter. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. All right enter in his 10th season at South Carolina, 25th overall as the head coach. So we're ready to go. This is not a split squad scrimmage. The way they do it is it's just offense against defense, and three quarterbacks are Garnet. Three quarterbacks are the black team. Now, under Coach Spurrier, it's a, it's a game and name only. A lot of this is uh, theatrics, especially yeah. with the off the bench <laughs> that we're looking forward to. Well, the folks are ready to go. And it's Sean Carson with a whistle blowing early. And there's your first example of it being much less than a game. The goal here is to make sure nobody gets hurt. Get, and get as many quality reps in as they can. So it'll be Dylan Thompson bringing out this offense to begin. Senior out of Boiling Springs, South Carolina. Who He's been a career backup. He's played in 25 games in his career, but as Maria and Coach Spurrier talked about, his first opportunity to be the full-time starter. And Coach Spurrier touched on a distinct skill set from Connor Shaw, who developed into a consistent passer, but was much more of a run threat. Coach Spurrier touched on the fact that they want Dylan Thompson to stay in that pocket, and he'll be bolstered at least his opportunity to be successful at the quarterback position with the surrounding players that he has up front. Offensive line is very stable. The receiving core is back. And he's got a good stable of running backs to share the backfield with. First play and first throw against a three-man rush. Goes underneath the Farrell Cooper. Sophomore to headlock North Carolina for seven. And it'll be second down and three. You mentioned the wide receiving core bringing a lot back. More than 75% of their receiving yards are back, but trying to replace that number one guy in Bruce Ellington. And I think they'll be able to do that. Now, Bruce Ellington, big plays and big moments, so they're going to have to have someone step up. You look at the Shaq Rollins, the Pharaoh Coopers, who seem to have the talent and capability to do just that. Mike Davis with his first touch for a first down. I think off his first year as the featured back in this offense. Mike Davis was a guy that you know you talk about Marcus Lattimore and, and the emergence of the South Carolina program and it started with the drumbeat of a steady running game. How do you replace a Lattimore? You don't. But Mike Davis emerged as one of the finest running backs in this conference a season ago. More than 1,100 yards, his second team all SEC. Has it in the draw play. Steps out of the tackle and the open space for six yards. He's been able to take it easy this spring, knowing that he's the starter, but running hard early. And you can see, uh, get some penetration early, making move in the hole. The shed would be tacklers, but also has breakaway speed. That was Sky Moore, the linebacker position on the defensive side of the ball, which is a unit that really is the most solidified coming into the season, which is different from a year ago. They came into spring practice wondering who the linebackers would be. Thompson well protected, floating one into coverage and incomplete. Over the head of Cooper. Third down and four. 
we touched on the fact that, that South Carolina is going to return the bulk of their receiving capabilities from a personnel standpoint. They only get about a quarter of their passing back. That makes sense given Connor Shaw's prominent role in the offense. But you've got Dylan Thompson, who's more than capable of operating the offense with the tools that he's been presented with. And he should be protected well as well, because this is by far the best offensive line unit that Coach Spurrier has returned in his 10 years here. Is well protected here with time to find Shaq Roland for first down. Roland, one of those guys they think could be the guy to replace Bruce Ellington as the headliner with the wide receiving group. You know, what they haven't had you know, since the departure of an Alshon Jeffrey, the big target, the yeah. guy that can go up and get a football, but they have receivers that can get separation. And you know, we thought a year ago the tight end position would emerge more in the passing game. We won't see much of uh, Busta Anderson here today. But Shaq Roland is a guy who can emerge with Ellington's departure. Brandon Wilds with his first touch and gets shut down in the hole. Gerald Dixon, TJ Holloman there on the stop. Dylan Thompson trying to replace Connor Shaw, who holds school records in just about every passing category and has taken this team like we talked about off of the top. In the bottom line, the wins and losses to an all-time high. You know, Connor Shaw became the quarterback that everybody expected from a Steve Spurrier football team. He just wasn't the type of quarterback that anyone would expect from a Steve Spurrier team. How about Wilds out of the backfield for a first down? And Brandon Wilds takes it down to the 20. A guy that's dealt with injuries over the course of his career. Goes for 23. A hallmark of any Spurrier offense is a running back that can be an excellent receiver out of the backfield. Brandon Wilds demonstrating his hands. He spin out of the backfield. It's a high percentage throw, but it's also a highly effective throw, especially when you know you've got good hands on the receiving end of it. And you've got a running back that can not only take a handoff, but make a reception. Wilds is open again out of the backfield. Instead, he checks it down to Nick Jones. That's one thing that Dylan Thompson does really well, take the check downs. That's what they're looking for. And I, you, you heard one of the first things that Coach Spurrier came out of his mouth when he's answering Maria Taylor. What are you looking for from your quarterback? He didn't say, I'm not looking for the bombs. I'm not looking for it. We wanted some touchdowns, obviously. There's no surprise. I want the football to come out. I want it to come out on time. Let the offense be what it's intended to be. Just operate it as it's called in the huddle. Dylan Thompson certainly has the tools to do it. Here's Wilds finding his seam, making a cut to set up first down and goal on this opening drive for the Black Squad. A nice lead block by a guy. They're pretty high on it, the center position. Cody Waldrop showing some mobility, leading Brandon Wilds out to the edge. This is something that they gonna, they're going to want to build upon. Really, the right guard position was the only question mark returning four of the five boys up front. The 10 play opening drive kept off by Brandon Wilds touchdown from three yards. Steve Spurrier has got to love to see his offense moving the ball like that. Well, it's, that's always a challenge as a head coach when you're playing yourself. Yeah. You're happy for one side of the ball and you got some question marks on the other. Your offense tic tacks its way right down the football field. You saw Kadidrick's Marcus come in there trying to make a tackle on Brandon Wilds. Wild showing some tough running, able to get it in the end zone. This is exactly what they want it to look like, though. A nice balanced approach. They're able to have their way with the front. Hard ends on the extra point. Ten play opening drive capped off by this Brandon Wilds touchdown run. It's the black team with the first score in this Garnet and Black game. Spring football action continues today on ESPN and ESPNU at 3 o'clock on ESPN. The defending champs, Florida State, and then at 4 on ESPNU, Clemson takes the field. But the spring football games today on ESPN and ESPNU, both games also live on Watch ESPN. So the black team scores on its opening drive. With Dylan Thompson going 4 of 5 on that possession. And the Garnet squad will get its first goal. And again, it's not split squad. It's just the quarterbacks are split up. Thompson and Perry Orth on the black squad. Connor Mitch and Brandon Nasevich on the Garnet squad. And it's Connor Mitch to get the first snaps for the Garnet team. It's been a, a hotly contested battle to find out who is going to apprentice 
under Dylan Thompson. Mitch off of the zone read pulls, and the whistle will blow to protect the quarterback. Now, I'm all for protecting the quarterback, but he would have gotten more than a yard on that play. Would he now? That's spoken like a former quarterback, Joe. He could have gotten blown up at the line of scrimmage. You hear these early whistles. And, you know, that's always the challenge, of course, with these read type of offenses where the quarterback can pull it. Now, how many yards were we going to get yeah, right there? Right. We'll never find out because last thing you need is to, to take out your backup or would-be backup in a spring game or a practice. Mitch's first throw into a window in the zone for a first down. Pick up of nine yards. You see that they still have some length, and the timing is, of course, right there. Breaking out of it, Drew Owens waiting on the football, and it arrives on time. Back to back throws for Mitch. And it goes underneath to Sean Carson. Good speed for Carson taking the ball inside the 25. DJ Gurley hustled back to make the tackle after 37 yards for the junior. Mitch goes through his progression, sees the check down right over the middle of the formation. He's right over the ball. Excellent job by Sean Carson showing his quarterback a target to hit. And we see there what Sean Carson can do when he gets out into open field. Well, his big breakaway game last year was versus Florida. He kind of flashed some of that speed, some of that breakaway capability that he can bring to this offense. Last year, really his first fully healthy season and took advantage. Here's a shot over the middle, broken up at the last moment. Drew Owens, the intended receiver, and Chris Moody out of his strong safety spot, jarred loose. You see Drew Owens, uh, he's allowing for some of that length over the middle. Ball's a little bit of high and behind. And Chris Moody to get over to break up the pass from his safety position. Defensively, for South Carolina, the backfield is, is somewhat of a question mark. You lose Victor Hampton, Jimmy Legree, the corner positions. They're looking for somebody to step up in coverage. Is it Rico McWilliams? Is it going to be Ollie Groves? David Williams with his first touch for two yards. Five starters happen to be replaced on this defense. You mentioned earlier the linebacking core, the strength. But you've got the two corners you lose, and you got three of the four starters up front. What's a bigger concern? Well, what's unfortunate is that one complements the other very much. The transmission of your defense is your linebacking core. It's fantastic that they're your signal callers. They allow for alignment. But if you're lean at the quarterback position, if you can pressure the Q QB, then you're okay. A lot of new faces in both of those positions, though, the quarterback and defensive end spots. David Williams tackled from behind by Kelsey Griffin after seven. <laughs> Set up a third down and short. So they lose, obviously, Jadavian Clowney, but they also lose Kelsey Quarles, and they lose Chaz Sutton as well. The only started they bring back, D.J. Surratt. You know, something that we haven't seen at South Carolina in a long time because if it wasn't Cliff Matthews and then it's Devin Taylor and it's Melvin Ingram and then it's Jadavian Clowney. And so it was like this passing of the torch at the defensive end position and up front and the Travian Robertsons. And now, other than Surratt, you've got a bunch of guys that they like that they need to come. They haven't gotten out there and really performed at that high level, whereas there's always someone to pick up where their previous player left off. Fourth down and short, they go for it. And it appears to pick it up. They were the best fourth down teams in the country last year on offense, one of the worst on defense on fourth down. Gutsy call right there, Joe. I'm surprised they didn't go for the field goal. Rolling the dice. Yeah. Garnet squad trying to answer the black squad's opening drive score. Williams turned the corner with a strong run for a touchdown. 11 yard score for the redshirt freshman from Philly, part of this deep running back core, but a guy they say might be the most talented of the bunch. And know what led by his right guard and center. They did an excellent job getting out in front. Will Sport, Clayton Stadnick, able to lead him up into the hole. Extra point coming from Elliott Fry. He walked on last fall and was a nice surprise for him. SEC All Freshman team.
So the black squad scores first. And then one drive later, eight plays later. It's David Williams getting a score credited to the Garnet squad. Story Conference in College Athletics has a new home. ESPN brings you the SEC Network. Launching August 14th, the SEC Network will feature more than a thousand exclusive live events, including 45 football games and 24-7 coverage of all 21 conference sports. Go to GetSECNetwork.com and tell your TV provider you refuse to miss out on the action. 45 SEC college football games, of course, all begins with South Carolina and Texas A&M on a Thursday night right here at williams Bryce. So both offenses, which is really one of the same, with an opening drive score. Black team went down and scored in the first possession, and then the Garnet team did it as well. So 7-7 seven, seven in a game that is, again, just offense against defense, not a split squad scrimmage necessarily. They just slave the quarterbacks as black team or garnet team. So the black team set to get it back again, likely going to be Dylan Thompson. Steve Spurrier saying it's a good chance he'll play the entire first half of this one. Jody Fuller to take a touchback. Welcome inside the booth once again now. We're joined by a special guest. It's Ray Tanner, the athletic director here at South Carolina. Ray, we appreciate you taking a moment to visit with us. We were saying earlier it's it's a spring game, it's a scrimmage, but it sure is fun to have football back in some form, isn't it? Well, it is fun, and certainly our fans are eager to be out here today. We had a big win last night in baseball, and they're excited to be at a football game today. And taking on Florida today in a big matchup in a three-game series for the baseball program that you, of course, helped build. How about the heroics for the baseball team recently? Seems like every game's coming down to one run, walk-off win, huh? Well, Coach Holbrook, he's done a wonderful job, and now that I'm athletics director, you know, we have to keep people in the seats. We've got to keep the concession stands going. <laughs> That's up. what it is. It's all by design. Here's Darrell Adams with a reception, taking it across the 40-yard line. Really now, we talked about off at the top. For football, and really for all of athletics here, this has turned into the golden age. But let's talk football with this being the spring game. How about what Steve Spurrier has done with this program and what it's meant for this program? Well, he's been remarkable. I remember when he came here in the fall of 2004, he immediately gave us credibility. He's an iconic coach. He's a former Heisman Trophy, and our success is been tremendous 33 wins in the last three years and he's an inspiration our fans love him he's coaching he makes it fun for the players coach talk about the impact on the breadth of the athletic department from the prominence of the athletic program and, and, and the football program specifically when you look at the facilities and the impact it can have on some of the other sports that are here well, last year we sold out all of our home games, seven home games, and we were sold out. We won 18 in a row here, the longest current winning streak in the country, and, and our fans are so excited and so passionate, and it has really helped all of our other sports. So we're, we're enjoying a great time. Baseball team we talked about, you mentioned helping all the other sports. How about women's basketball and the season they put together? Well, Coach Staley, two out of the last three years in the Sweet 16, phenomenal. She's a, she was a great player, three gold medals, and she's a wonderful coach. And, you know, I don't usually put any pressure on the coaches because I was one for so long. But I can assure you the best is yet to come for Coach Staley in women's basketball. I wonder if she's a good receiver. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just curious. You throwing you know, your, everybody's I've got, got their guesses. I've got for some who theories on the off the bench play today, well, coach. Well, I can assure you, if anything is thrown her way, she will catch. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, you had Dylan Thompson as an intern during the off season. He's a sports and entertainment management major. What'd you learn about Dylan over that? Well, first of all, he's a wonderful human being. He's a great young man. It's been so much fun having him in the AD's office this semester, and I'm trying to learn as much as I can about the sets and the plays. So next fall, I'll know what's going on <laughs> exactly. as it's developing, but he, he's learned so much from us, and we've learned so much from him. We're glad to have him. Coach, uh, what about the expectations that are around this football program now? Uh, the fact that there's been such a high level of achievement and, and year over year over year, you know, heading into the season, what's left? You've beaten BCS Bowl champions, but I haven't had an opportunity to participate in a BCS Bowl, an SEC championship, had an opportunity to play for that. It seems as if the bar has been set incredibly high. 
Well, there's a there was a time around here that if you won seven or eight games, it was a pretty good year. And Coach Spurrier is changing all that, and he keeps talking about winning an SEC championship. We've done some good things, but there's a lot left, and hopefully he'll be here for a lot of years to come. Well, I know we're all looking forward to the fall, and specifically the beginning of the fall. You guys open things up on the SEC network, which we're all fired up about. Well, we're excited about it, too. I was uh, meeting with two groups this morning, and that was part of my spiel about the 28th. You got to be here, and if you're not, you better have it on your, your television. So we're excited to be the first football game on the new network. We're excited to be a part of it as well. Ray Tanner, athletic director here at South Thank Carolina. You. We appreciate you spending some time on Thanks, this Coach. spring game Saturday with us. Thank you for being here today. Thompson throwing onto the corner that's broken up, intended for rolling with a flag coming in. Rico McWilliams likely going to get called for the pass interference. Pass interference on the defense, number one. The ball will be placed in the spot of the foul. Automatic first down. And that indeed is what the call is. Just a little extra activity. You can see it's they don't uh, they don't necessarily appreciate it when uh, when you hold the jersey. And I found that to be the case as a former offensive lineman that uh, oftentimes it's called too too much but of course if it's against your receiver it can't be called enough mm. so this is a big hit by the way yeah we're over there talking about it helmets are popping off out there which steve spurrier probably doesn't love to see right i mean you, you enjoy as williams plunges in for a second score you enjoy seeing your guys playing physical but ooh, you hold your breath yeah you, coach spurrier doesn't like it coach ward loves it i'm sure <laughs> you can't see enough of that going on but once again you know, we've seen demonstrated on a couple of occasions some good tough inside runs and some nice holes in which to insert those runs. Offensive front has done a, a, a pretty consistent job thus far in this game taking care of business versus the defensive front. A defensive front that we've mentioned is going to be largely reconstructed headed into this year. Somewhat of a departure from what South Carolina has had to deal with before at that position. Well, ESPN is the home of the new college football playoff for the very first time. Top four teams in the country, of course, will play a seeded semifinal for the right to advance to the national championship game. College football playoff coming New Year's Day exclusively on ESPN. The championship game is nine months from today, but you hate to start those countdowns because there's going to be so much magic between now and then. It always seems every year, even under the, the old system, they now antiquated and it's, it's in the salvage yard now. Yeah. And a lot of people are happy to see it, the BCS system as it were. And it always seemed to work out with uh, with a little bit of fireworks there towards the end of the season, but a definitive champion nonetheless. This system, though, just gives us that much more great football at yep. the end of the year. Three possessions. Three scores. So the offense having its way with the defense so far. It's an offense that is returning eight starters. It's a defense returning only six starters. And Nick Jones receives the kick. And then they'll take the ball out around the 25 yard line. How about for the offensive line? We keep talking about the fact that they have four returners up front. The continuity of that, how important is that? It's very important. I mean, you look at guys that there's not a position where you have to work in concert with one another more than offensive front. Uh, and that's not to take anything away from the rapport that has to develop between a receiver and a quarterback. But the more starts, the more reps that you can get for that unit, and they have to operate as a unit, five individuals kind of playing as one, the better they can function in the offense. Devin Potter with his first carry loses a couple of yards. And it'll be second down and 12, but especially when you're trying to break in it. Granted, he's a senior, but you're trying to break in a new quarterback into a full time role. Yeah, that's something that I think we, we hit on a little bit earlier is that, yeah, you know, Coach Spurrier said not a lot of starts for Dylan Thompson, but he's surrounded by a lot of game experience, not only at the skill positions, but at his five best friends up front. Those guys are going to allow him the latitude and the time to operate whatever play is called. Flag comes in. We have a flag. We're going to fall start. Fall start. Offense. Number eight. Five-yard penalty. Still second down. Shamir Jeffrey. 
So Connor Mitch, part of one of the more compelling battles this spring, that is for the number two quarterback job, coming into this weekend, it started to have the feel that he's maybe moved ahead, but there was a while there where the walk on Perry Orth seemed to be the lead for the number two quarterback job. And Coach Spurrier is notorious for willing to make a change. He's willing to stick whomever, whatever, in at that quarterback position. I don't know if Perry Orth, who, who understandably was having a strong spring, maybe faded a little bit there towards the end. Nice shot out there on the, on the sideline, along the sideline there. But sometimes Coach Spur can use that to light a fire under some of these other guys that may be scholarship. Jody Fuller running hard here, too. Good job. Beg your pardon, it was Garrett Shank. Or Devin Potter that carried it out of the backfield. Somebody, there's hundreds of guys down there. <laughs> They're all wearing the same jersey. Yeah. Third down and eight. And Mitch well protected to take a shot over the middle. It was caught and then fumbled. That'll be a turnover. And headed the other way is Chris Moody, who's off to a good start in this game defensively. So it'll be a completion and then a fumble. Jody Fuller caught it and had it jarred loose by Sky Moore. So through with a quarter in the South Carolina spring game. This is the first time the defense has gotten a stop. Three touchdowns for the offense. Defense just came up with its first stop in this Garnet and Black game in Columbia. And ESPN News coverage of college lacrosse continues with two of the nation's top teams battled it out today at two. Terps taking on the Blue Jays. Old Spice College Lacrosse, Maryland and Johns Hopkins today at two. Not ESPNU and live on Watch ESPN. Perry Orth into the game for the first time. A sophomore from Florida. A walk on who for a while like we said was in line to be the number two last week struggled some over the last week. Steve Spurrier even said he maybe read a few too many of the press clippings saying that he had moved into the number two spot. It's a good way to get your your quarterback's attention whomever it is. And his first throw gets intercepted. Jamari Smith picks it off and that's back to back plays with a turnover for the South Carolina offense. So under through the deep ball looking for Jeffrey. Looking for Jeffrey downfield. And Jeffrey's able to get behind coverage, but this ball woefully underthrown floated out of the hands of Orth. And Jamari Smith there to make the play as it floated down. I don't know if the ball slipped out of Orth's hand, but he certainly didn't get much on it. And clearly Coach Spurrier giving him an opportunity to push the football downfield. Really the first downfield throw that we've seen other uh, then the post that was really dislodged on the previous possession resulting in another uh, turnover. Go big or go home, I guess. Yeah, you, right. don't, you don't have much to lose uh, kid in his position. I'm surprised we haven't seen more downfield throws. Yeah. Really, there's, there's very little to lose here. We've already gone for it on fourth down. Now we see Brendan Nasevich for the first time, fourth quarterback to check into the game. He's part of the Garnet team. The defense used the timeout there, had only 10 men on the field. Jamari Smith, who just had the interception, realized it's a spring game and the defense still is on the field. Jamari Smith's playing for multiple teams, yeah. which might work out just fine if he's able to make plays like he previously did. Jamari Smith, one of those guys that's competing for the vacancies at the cornerback position. They've got some guys that have gotten reps. But he, some corners some coverage ability to step up knowing that the pressure might not be there from the front four. Lorenz Bryant with his first touch stepped out of an arm tackle then got dragged down by Jonathan Walton. You know another thing South Carolina has talking about that cornerback spot is three ESPN 300 corners incoming in the fall. No early enrollees but help us come in a few moments. And I'd be surprised if they didn't get a good long look at the opportunity to contribute, if not at the start of the football game, certainly with the spread offenses, the tempo that we see, not only 
college football wide, but specifically in the SEC, they're going to need depth at the defensive back position. Nasevich taking his first shot downfield. Solid defense coming from Smith. Incomplete. South Carolina recruiting class, top 20 class, 10 members of the ESPN 300. That includes those three ESPN 300 corners. Chris Lamons, an athlete that will come in here to play corner, and then two ESPN 300 D linemen as well, so addressing needs with this class. Makes sense seeing the emphasis, knowing how the ros roster was going to turn over. No surprise that Clowney makes the leap. The big void created by Kelsey Quarles at the defensive line position inside, who had a big year. That one flutters through a window and is caught for a first down. As complete. Sprawling catch made by Carlton Hurd for 11 yards. Nice ball from Nasevich, fitting it in the window right on time. See Hurd just kind of sitting there in the soft spot. Hurd able to corral the pass. Nasevich is, is more of the runner. A very adept runner at that. Would not be surprised if, if they do implement a wildcat scenario. If it's not Pharaoh Cooper, then Nasevich getting some touches out of the shotgun in that type of a formation and look. Played in three games as a redshirt freshman last year. Has time to float one here on target for Jeffrey, but dropped. Rico McWilliams with the coverage. Going to be second down. Lots of hand fighting. Shamir Jeffrey, you see, trying to get separation from McWilliams. Nice coverage. McWilliams able to get his head around right there at the tail end. A lot of these passes, though, really other than a Thompson floater and Orth's pick, where I would think the coaches are pleased with the accuracy and placement of the football. Lorenz Bryant behind that offensive line, returning four starters, strength of this offense without a doubt. They've started to roll in some of the twos in the O-line as well. well. Athletic offensive front at that. A lot of these runs that we've seen pulling one and two offensive linemen to the point of attack with borrowing blockers, creating a numbers advantage at the point where you're trying to penetrate that defensive front. They've had success at the goal line, and they've been able to pick three and four yards at a time. Pocket collapses, got rid of it with a dangerous throw that was broken up. Rico McWilliams with the coverage on Matthew Harvey. It's fourth down. Does he gamble again? Does he roll the dice? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what are the odds? It's so difficult, you know, when you look at it. You really have to weigh the pros and cons. <laughs> They're going to attempt a field goal here, and it'll be a long one for Elliott Fry. It was on the SEC all freshman team last year. This will be a 48 yarder. Out of the hold of Perry Orth. And he pushes it just wide. So the defense, after giving up touchdowns on the first three possessions of this spring game, has gotten three consecutive stops. The Paul Feinbaum Show begins Monday, August 15th on the SEC Network, a daily four-hour radio show where ESPN Radio's Paul Feinbaum shares compelling opinions on SEC football through his deep knowledge of the conference and interaction with those passionate callers that have followed him for years. The Paul Feinbaum Show, every Monday through Friday, starting in August, we've got Paul Feinbaum with us right now. We were talking earlier, I know it's a spring game, but it sure is nice to have football back in some way, isn't it? No, I was thinking about that driving over this morning that it's, it's not here yet, but it yeah. feels like it's here. And not, with all due respect to basketball, I, I think a lot of the audience that listens to me and watches us here, uh, they, they want to see football. And they're seeing a really good team. And this team, I was talking to Coach Spurrier before the game, I, I think they'll get to Atlanta. They are good enough. I'm not sure they're good enough to, to go beyond that, but with, with the way the Gamecocks have played the last couple of years, uh, in being in the top ten every year, they, this is a really impre impressive program. The SEC East has been such a muddled picture over the last few years with the five champions in the last seven seasons. What about this group? Do you like? 
Well, I, I like Coach Spurrier to start with. I yeah. know that's not what you asked me. But uh, the, the job that he has done, and we were, we were joking a few minutes ago on the field about Alabama recruiting every year with, with the number one class. South Carolina doesn't do that, so you have to adjust. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't have Jadavion Clowney this year. They've lost a couple of other key players, but, but I, I think uh, I saw some players that they're running back that looks really good. Uh, clearly, some adulation of what Steve Spurrier has been able to do in his career in the, the pantheon of great coaches, and maybe not even specific to the SEC. Where do you put them? On the whole big totem pole of great high achieving leaders of the college football yeah. era. A number of years ago, I said he was the best coach in the SEC since Bear Bryant. Well, Nick Saban showed up and has impressed us uh, pretty mightily. Uh, in, in fact, Saban was, I thought, a 109-yard return away from maybe being in a position to be the greatest coach. Um, I think Steve Spurrier and Nick Saban are very similar. They're, they're at the same level. Spurrier does not have the, the number of national championships. But I will say winning here and finishing in the top 10 as consistently as South Carolina has done, in some ways equal or better what Alabama does, because Alabama is a traditional program. This is not. SEC Network's first game, of course, will be here at williams Bryce Stadium against Texas A&M on that opening Thursday night of the season. That's a Texas A&M team coming in with questions in more significant spots than this one. Yeah, one in particular. Yeah. Uh, actually, two, and I can think of three in particular. Um, that's going to be a tough game for, for the Aggies. But Kevin Sumlin has also recruited very, very well. I, I think the heat's going to be on them without Johnny Manziel, without uh, an All-American receiver. And I, I like South Carolina in that game, but uh, you guys have been here. You've played here. It will be about 130 degrees. That, that actually helps out uh, Texas A&M. They're, they're more used to it. Yeah, they've got that up-tempo type of offense, which proved to be kind of a storyline during the offseason, one of the most outspoken voices as a proponent, even though they don't really employ it very much, was Coach Spurrier saying that, look, I, the whole 10-second rule, let's allow defenses to substitute an advantage for the Aggies in a, in a hot climate. What do you make of that entire conversation that kind of emerged out of the coaches' meetings? I hate to quote Shakespeare here on a college football Saturday, but in many respects, much ado about nothing. I think it was a, a tremendous overreaction. It's going to come up again. I think Nick Saban, in many respects, was vilified. He was giving an opinion. He was invited to come up there. Spurrier didn't help matters any by calling it the Saban rule. But you played at Georgia. That's Steve Spurrier. He knows how to gig. Texas A&M, South Carolina, that Thursday night opener. Temple and Vanderbilt will follow it with Vanderbilt, of course, uh, breaking in a new head coach as well. Let's, let's flip over to the West a little bit here. Doriel Green Beckham, of course, dismissed at Missouri. How does that reshape the picture in that division? That's a devastating blow because uh, Missouri with, with DGB has had a chance to contend. But without him, I, I think uh, they, they have an uphill climb. Uh, that was a sad story because he was the number one recruit in the country a couple of years ago. But give Gary Pinkle credit. Uh, he didn't waste any time, and he shouldn't have wasted any time. Uh, that was definitely a, a difficult decision to make, especially after the emergence of that program, to be able to build on a season and then to lose one of the hallmarks, knowing that you've got Matty Mock stepping into the yeah. quarterback position. So when you look at the SEC and the breadth of them, all the teams, Outside of the state of Mississippi, not a lot of known commodities that may be the most important position on the field at quarterback. Who do you think out of Tuscaloosa, which is one of the question marks coming into the season, is going to ultimately be the signal call? I think it will be someone who will not be playing next week uh, in the spring game, and that's Jacob Coker from Florida State. Uh, I think he is their best option. Uh, a sense Lane Kiffin, that's hard to say, Lane Kiffin at Alabama will, really likes him and wanted him badly. And, and I think he'll move in pretty quickly. Because you, you, understudy for Jameis Winston is not a bad role to, to take over at Alabama. You talk about departed quarterbacks. You know, one here in South Carolina and Connor Shaw. And there was a lot of conversation about, you know, Aaron Murray being a record holder. But where does he fit amongst the Johnny Manziels or the winners like an A.J. McCarron? But seemingly, you know, quietly, Connor Shaw did nothing but win football games in South Carolina. And under duress, you know, without a Lattimore, amongst injuries, coming off the bench with a bad shoulder, was he maybe the most underappreciated quarterback in the conference? Well, I think he was. I mean, I think Aaron Murray at times was underappreciated as well. But I think he finally got his due at the end. And unfortunately, with the injury, I think people finally realized what they had not been saying. But, but Connor Shaw was always under the radar screen, but that happens sometimes when you're around, uh, you mentioned Lattimore, and Jadavion Clowney just uh, sucked a lot of the, uh, the air out of other attention uh, leading into last season. How about another underappreciated guy on this team that second team all-conference, but probably doesn't get as much 
pub as he deserves in Mike Davis. That was a good point. I, mean, I, I think that's what's fascinating about, about South Carolina, and that's why I really like this program. They're, they're, you don't pay a lot of attention to these players, but like like Davis, like others, because of there have been some stars, and that's a that's yeah. a change too. Because Spurrier early on was not getting those big time players. Now he is. He's not getting as many as some of the other schools, but he got enough to to get a foundation here. Now this program is off and running. Brendan Nasevich putting together a solid drive for the Gamecocks. No whistle it dead before the defense gets near him. Mike Davis who we were talking about and one thing Matt and I had been talking about before you joined us is that yeah you're breaking in a new starting quarterback but you're doing it with pieces around him like Davis and like an offensive line that brings back four starters from a season ago and I think what this program has more than anything else is confidence uh, I mean they've beaten Clemson five years in a row that, that's remarkable yeah. when you when you think about it considering Clemson won a BCS game uh, they've had a good run against Georgia until last year in Athens and, but I think that will go their way this year if you're making predictions so I mean South Carolina has has really they had the, the so-called chicken curse where no matter what happened they couldn't get over it now South Carolina is over the hump Sprayer exudes confidence the program is exuding a little bit of confidence and that will matter a lot. Blow it down with Nasevich getting inside the five I think that one was appropriate Matt as far as where they spotted him. Was it now? Yeah. yeah, that was all right. Yeah, I think that was a fair. <laughs> you can see, you know, they're, they're on the thumb. They're working on the other hand now as far as versus Clemson. So you look at these rivalry games, and we asked Coach Spurrier last year, you know, who would you rather beat, Georgia or Clemson? He said, well, I don't know. If they, since they're playing each other in the opener, can they tie? <laughs> you, can't have, you can't have ties anymore, so we can't do that. But on, on the scale of rivalries, you know, from bitterness, from hostility, on the scale of zero to Iron Bowl, where does South Carolina Clemson rank on those rivalry games? Oh, it's it's a hair below the Iron Bowl. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because, and I think it's getting there. When you think about that five in a row, and I frankly think it's going to go to six this year. And Dabo Sweeney just got a new contract extension. Yeah. Can you imagine in, in where, you, where you played losing uh, to Florida? Five years ago. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have to imagine that, Paul. But, but <laughs> I was trying to be a gentleman. <laughs> too kind, far too kind. But but it's, it's it's hard to believe. Yeah, Paul Feinbaum, we appreciate Thank the time so much. Thing. Two to yeah, six on the SEC Great Network time. starting in August. The Paul Feinbaum Show. Back to South Carolina in a moment. Matt Schick here back in the studio. We'll be with you at halftime. We'll have more on Missouri's dismissal of its top receiver. All eyes on the Heisman Trophy winning quarterback in Tallahassee today. We'll take you around the country. Other spring game highlights. Join us at half. See you in a few, Joe. All right, Matt. And Matt, did you happen to see Florida State's new uh, new uniforms? They released some new uniforms. If you didn't, I'm I, sure you will soon. I can't stay on top of the new uniform carousel. Man. You're not I on just, Twitter, though. I just spin it. I'm quiet. I lurk. I don't tweet. Ah, hanging in the shadows. That's the right. Twitter shadows. The fly on the wall. Yeah. Well, they released some new uniforms. They've got an alternate black. At Florida State. Yeah, so you, you need a backup. You yeah, always you gotta got have to. that alternate jersey. Got to keep up in recruiting, right? Everybody's doing it. And they collide and they will blow it down. Let's check in with Maria Taylor, who's with Connor Shaw. That's right, guys. Connor, you win a perfect 17 0 here at Williams Rice. Tell me some of your favorite memories of putting on your uniform here. Uh, there's a lot. It's very bittersweet. It feels a little strange coming out here and not suiting up, but uh, I have a lot of great memories here the past four years. What do you think is going to be most important for Dylan Thompson as he takes over the reins in his senior year? Just be his own. He's good at doing that, not, not worrying about anything else. Uh, he has nothing to prove. He's playing a lot of big games, and I think he'll do a great job this year. He said that he sp talks to you a lot whenever he can, about two or three times a week. What's usually your message for him? Uh, we're, we're really good friends, Came, you know, best friends couple past couple of years. And, and we talk. Uh, it's not all about football. You know, um, We hang out with each other on and off the field. But you know, we kind of exchange advice. Um, my main advice to him is, is, like I said, just come out here and, and do his own thing. 
Well, you've been through your pro day, so a lot of that major work is behind you. What is the whole NFL draft prospect process been like for you? Yeah, it's, it's been a long process. Um, taking advantage of all the opportunities that's given me. I love the stage that's that's been given to me, so um, I'm excited for it and a little anxious, but I'm ready for it to be all over. What's the response you've gotten from NFL clubs? I've got a lot of positive, a lot of positive feedback, anywhere from round five to round seven to free agency. So it's nothing I can control. Uh, so I'm just going to look forward to the process. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, Maria. And Maria Taylor is a bit of a star around here today, Matt. I don't know if you heard. Maria has been announced as the sideline reporter for the number one game on the SEC Network, joining Brett Mossberger and Jesse Palmer on this Saturday night game. So she'll be here for the opener, Texas a and against South Carolina. She'll have a large presence as far as the studio hosting and reporting goes throughout the week as well. So a well-deserved congratulations, Maria. Oh, thanks, Joe. Thanks, Matt. I'm looking forward to it. I'm sure they are. That's a five-star recruit right there. We're talking about recruiting. <laughs> Basketball, volleyball. Yeah. If I could have played football, I probably would have been a good receiver. I've got I'm big hands. Uh, Coach Spurrier's probably down there thinking about that. He is. <laughs> yeah, Maria. Basketball and volleyball <laughs> and Georgia. Got a couple of Georgia Bulldogs in the house today. Yeah, some, somewhat of a... Uh, a little bit out of place, perhaps. Yeah, you, you were even getting or a little flack observers. up here. Yeah, I was. I, I caught yeah. a few bullets. Folks were uh, throwing a few jabs here and there. I can take the body blows. Remember, you're here for the spring game. It's not. There's nobody to cheer against. Everybody's undefeated. I'm confident South Carolina will get the victory today. Especially with the aggressive style from Coach Spurrier. That's right. Fourth down. <laughs> That's right. Thompson scrambling. They let the play go long enough for him to turn the ball yeah, out. Well, how about Dylan Thompson? He's been solid, huh? He has been. I think he's been exactly what they were looking for. The quarterback position throws have been timely and well placed. He's been willing to stay in the pocket, though we just saw him flush, get out of bounds, get yardage while you can, but hitting check downs right over the middle, getting his running backs involved spreading the football around and as we've touched on he's gotten meaningful snaps and so it's not as if he hasn't been out there on the yard with these receivers with this group before but now he's the guy and it's always a little bit different when you come into the season and it's your football team we've seen Coach Spurrier do this on occasion in the past where this is our quarterback coming into the season but the fact that Dylan Thompson's a senior the fact that he's got some younger guys that could be the heir apparent to Connor Shaw, I think, just demonstrates that they are more than confident with what Dylan Thompson brings at the quarterback position, very much solidly taking hold of the quarterback spot, and he's the hub of what they're going to want to do on the offensive side of the football. 7 of 10 today for 99 yards. Hasn't really taken many shots down the field, but has effectively moved the team down the field with a short game. David Williams has been sharp today. Redshirt freshman running back, part of this deep running back core. David Williams is a guy who's missed a little bit of time, had a tweaked hamstring, but knowing that they want to keep Mike Davis nice and healthy and that they're going to share some carries. You know, Connor Shaw was the second leading rusher on the South Carolina football team two years running, and that included when Marcus Lattimore was in the lineup. And so because of that, there's a void created as far as rushing attempts are concerned. It can't be all Mike Davis throughout the balance of this schedule. They're going to need key contributors, and if it's Brandon Wilds. Here's the off of the bench play touchdown. for a touchdown to Dawn Staley, the head women's basketball Dawn coach Staley. here. There is a flag down. There's a flag on the play. There's a flag, and it might be coming back. Yeah, we might have to run it again. <laughs> Bring it back. All right, a rule is a rule. Last year, it was Jadavion Clowney they brought off of the bench to make that catch for a touchdown. He fell, got back up, NFL rules, and took it in. Break this one down for us, Matt Stinchko. Well, you can see excellent protection. Not much of a rush from the guys up front. They're just standing around. And then how do you get behind the coverage that quickly? Here's how. Coach Staley, look at that little Sutter Fuge. Very subtle. Look at her, look it in. Great catch, using the belly button as well as both hands <laughs> to make the reception. Not sure what the penalty was. I think they declined it. And it could have been a celebration penalty for the Snow Angel. Yeah, that was a bit much, I thought. Mm -hmm. I don't know that Coach has done that before, though. What a season she led her women's basketball squad to. First number one seed in the history. All the way into the Sweet 16 before lost to North Carolina. Best season in program history and part of this 
best uh, era of athletics in South Carolina history. You know, she's not the only Staley to ever score a touchdown here in South Carolina. Her cousin Deuce Staley yeah. was a pretty good running back for a lot of years. Went on with the Philadelphia Eagles. Let's check in with Maria, who's with Coach Staley. All right, Coach, you just scored the almost winning touchdown <laughs> to end the first half. How did this play come about? Well, I got a call from Coach Barrier. He called my number, and I came through for him. Did you have to practice? I did not practice, but I went back to my old North Philly days where I used to play football. I used to be the quarterback, not the receiver, but I was glad Dylan put it out there for me to catch. Well, you know, Spurrier told me before he wanted a woman to come in. He said he needed someone who could catch the ball, and he said you had good mitts. So how did he know that? I got good hands. Coach is a quarterback, so he, he knows what kind of play to call to make people look good and make me look good today. <laughs> oh, congratulations. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it, Maria. Thanks, Coach Staley. We should have known when we saw Coach Staley down there working on the jugs machine, just uh, spinning yeah. around, catching one-handed, oh, sparing yeah. them. Very impressive, actually. Eyes closed. <laughs> Her hands it might be awesome. bigger than Clowney's. Yeah. You know, when you're a, a gold medal winning basketball player, I think that a wide open heave oh, downfield is nothing than catching the basketball in traffic. Yeah. Another solid crowd for this Garnet and Black game. Last year they had 35,000, which fell just short of the record for the spring game. The record 38 plus in Steve Spurrier's first year about a decade ago. But we pulled in a couple hours before the game and we were having a snake through people involved in the fan fest. Yeah, a lot of folks, you know, we were visiting with athletic director Tanner earlier. We talked about the impact on, on facilities and the other sports, but also fan engagement. You know, South Carolina has always enjoyed tremendous fan support, but that, a lot of that was in spite of their exploits on the football field. That's no longer the case. These fans are coming in droves as they always have. But they've got plenty to cheer about from the product that they see out on the football field, and they were eager to get out here today on what has proven to be a beautiful day to be playing football this early in the year. And this running play will run the clock. Down near the end of this first half. Kevin Potter with some good yardage there. It's Coach Spurrier who will have an earpiece in so he can hear us. We'll have a microphone on so he can talk to us during the third quarter of this Garnet and Black game. So make sure you stick around through halftime. Be able to join us for the third quarter of this game. Get a little bit of insight into his mind during the spring game. Maybe talk a little Masters as well. Talk a little golf with him. I think he's a fan. Uh, I'm confident yeah. that he's, he's somewhat of an enthusiast for the game of golf. Second only maybe to this sport here. So 21-10, the black squad in front of the Garnet squad at halftime. Now we go to Matt Sick and Charles Arbuckle in the ESPNU studio. Thank you, Joe. It's all South Carolina today on the scoreboard. <laughs> Stay tuned. Back on the SEC on ESPN, the South Carolina spring game, the Garnet and Black game here at williams Bryce Stadium. The black squad with a 21-10 lead. On the Garnet team, we welcome you back inside. Matt Stinchcom, who was an All-American at Georgia. Joe Davis, Maria Taylor's down on the field. How about some highlights from that first half with the offense dominating over the first few possessions of the game and then the defense getting it going. But Dylan Thompson stepping into the full-time starter role for the first time this year, pretty sharp in this spring game. He did look sharp. It looks like a continuation of what we've heard has come out of spring practice so far this season, poised in the pocket. Didn't seem to want to flush. Of course, there's not a whole lot of live pass rush going on. And David Williams stepping up in his role as well, coming over off a hamstring injury, a little bit of a tweak during the spring. But he's had some tough runs. There have been some nice holes opened up by this offensive front. And then, of course, a lot of the coaching staff to get involved a little bit off the basketball court and onto the football field. And Coach Staley. Nice celebration too. A little, a little side, a little, yeah. little side stain on the backside of the t-shirt. Well, Snow Angel, we promised it during the second quarter. We'll provide it now. Steve Spurrier joins us down on the sideline now, Coach. It's been a, a great afternoon here with beautiful weather. What a great thing you've got going here with this spring game. I know the folks here love it. 
Okay, I hope you're talking to me. I, guess, I am, uh, okay. yes. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what, we uh, sort of have a spring show more than a game so much. We try to let all the youngsters play, and hopefully nobody gets hurt. Although I think Sean Carson sprained his shoulder a little bit early in the game. Well, Coach, coming into this this show, how have the practices looked? Have you been pleased with the players that had to step up, some significant voids created? Certainly the quarterback position, you've got an apprentice in Dylan Thompson. But what about the receiver position? You feel as if you've got the playmakers there that will fill the void with the departure of Bruce. Yeah, we really got everybody back except, of course, Connor Shaw, one of the best quarterbacks ever play here, if not the best, and Bruce Ellington uh, and an offensive lineman. But uh, so most of the guys are back. We got a lot of experience on offense. We got we'll have some new players in the D line and the defensive back. So, uh, uh, but we'll 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 have a chance to have another real good offense. We we believe Dylan has the opportunity to really be a good player. Is it different coming into this season, coach, knowing that you've got the consistency up front from your offensive line, seemingly the first time in your your ten years here at South Carolina, where you've got a, a foundation to build upon with the guys up front? Yeah, certainly when you got, uh, gosh, four uh, third and fourth, fifth year uh, senior offensive linemen or older linemen, I should say, uh, you got a chance to have a top offensive line. So it, it should be one of our best ever offensive lines here. You mentioned earlier when Maria asked you what were you looking for out of Dylan Thompson and the quarterbacks and, and the fact that you want him to stay in the pocket, that Connor was a distinct skill set. He was more of a runner. Where is that run element going to come from? Will it come from Thompson? Will it just be paired back? Or are you going to get well, some other guys involved? Yeah, he can run a bit, and actually Dylan's a pretty good runner, but he, he doesn't need to run as much as Connor Shaw did. Uh, we don't have much experience behind him, and uh, we want Connor to go the distance. So what he does best, I think, is stand there in the pocket and uh, deliver the ball and throw it and make audibles. But he's capable of running also, so he'll run uh, yeah, maybe three to five times a game. Uh, Coach, the number two quarterback spot is one that I know has been in flux and has been a story throughout this spring. What have you seen from the quarterbacks vying for that number two spot today? They've all done pretty well, and most of them have not played any at all yet. So uh, they'll go through the summer. You know, the summer's a lot longer than uh, 15 practices in the spring. So we'll see which one gets the best, uh, improves the most through the summer probably. Going to the other side of the ball, Coach, this many new faces in your front four, knowing that you got a ton of production out of Kelsey Quarles, a big spot vacated with, with Jadavian leaving for the pros. How has that position or that front line shaped out in your eyes over the course of spring practice? I think uh, these players have done pretty well. Now, there's some new players like Deion Green in there, number uh, 93. He hasn't played much here yet, but he's had an excellent spring. He's tough to block. Mason Harris on the other side, and Darius English right there, number 18, missing the tackle. <laughs> but uh, uh, Darius is a, a strong young man that uh, should play, should play very well. When, when you look at your, your cornerback position with, with the spots there now that are available, have you been pleased with the play from the guys that have opportunity now to see more time on the field? Yeah, they've done pretty well, and we signed, uh, I think, tr three uh, defensive corners that were pretty highly rated kids coming out of high school, so they're going to get a chance to play. I don't know which one will do most of the playing yet or who's going to beat who out, uh, but some freshmen coming in, at defensive back and maybe some defensive linemen. We signed one or two that, that might can help us there also. When we looked at the spur position, that was the linebacker position in general, really. We were in the spring game last year, but the spur position especially, we heard about how tight that contest mm -hmm. was between Diggs and Go Lightly. I know that Go Lightly's had some injuries, I think, this spring. What are y'all thinking at that spur position, your hybrid linebacker defensive back spot? Yeah, uh, Sherrod Golightly has played well. He's played well. He's made a lot of big plays here at uh, South Carolina. And in fact, the fourth and one against Wisconsin in the bowl game, he knifed in there and hit the guy behind the line. Uh, a huge play in that game. Uh, so he's ready to go. And uh, Jordan Diggs has played well. Uh, we'll probably play both those guys a bit.
Y'all had six straight wins to end the season last year. Did that momentum carry over into the offseason workouts? We've read that Coach Connolly, your strength and conditioning coach, has done an excellent job putting some weight on some of the guys up front. Yeah. Well, anytime you even just win your last one, the bowl game, uh, you got some momentum. Everybody's happy. Uh, you know that old saying, you're only as good as your last game. So we've been fortunate to win at the end and win the bowl game, beat uh, our in-state rival uh, every year now for five years. So, so we've had good off seasons. Uh, when you win those last five, six in a row, you have a good off season. So uh, hopefully we can continue doing that. Yeah, how about game one, Coach? I know something we're all fired up about here with the SEC Network coming in, you guys being the very first game on the SEC Network taking on Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're looking forward to uh, just playing on that Thursday night. Uh, We've uh, been fortunate ESPN has televised us uh, just about every year since I've been here. Starting in 05, we opened up on Thursday night. And now 10 years later, we're opening up again on Thursday. So it's, uh, it's always fun when you win that game. I think we've been fortunate to win all of them. So hopefully that will continue, but who knows. You got a master's prediction for us before we let you go? Oh, no. Only a fool makes predictions, I think. <laughs> so, But we got a chance to have a good team, or, or we could fall flat on our face if we go bad. Uh, but I really think we got pretty good uh, leadership from some of the older guys, and I think uh, I think they'll prepare to play well this year. Coach Spurry, we appreciate okay. you joining us. All right. Thank you, man. Thanks for being here. Steve Spurrier, 10th season at South Carolina, 25th overall as a collegiate head coach. Only Bear Bryant has won more SEC games than Steve Spurrier. You know, we touched on it with, when Paul Feinbaum had joined us earlier in the ball game, the first half. But where does Coach Spurrier rank to see what he's done at these two places? And then we throw in Duke. Now, Duke was able to compete for the ACC championship. They were unable to capture it. They won it under Steve Spurrier. And his final year there, he was ACC coach of the year two years in a row. He goes to Florida and built that program. They didn't have any SEC championships before Steve Spurrier got there. He's done this before. 21-10, black squad in front of the Garnet as his spring game rolls on in Columbia. Spring football continuing later today, starting with the defending national champ, Florida State. James Winston on display in what is a split squad game. So they do split that roster, play head to head. Clemson's at four on ESPNU. No Deshaun Watson in that game, but Cole Stout and Chad Kelly will continue to battle to replace Taj Boyd as Clemson's starting quarterback. And of course, having to replace Rob McDowell at running back, too. Deshaun Watson highly touted, but even if he is healthy, May not be the starters, Stout and Kelly, both talented guys battling for that number one job as well. Watson not playing in that spring game with a collarbone injury. Four o'clock today on ESPNU. He's going to be a great player for that team from upstate. Yeah, right. You know, that orange team from upstate. You know, this is you know, South Carolina is one of those rivalries where they don't even want to mention. I'm a little bit hesitant, actually, to say Clemson in these confines. If you look at uh, these types of ball games, you look at what South Carolina's been able to build, the rivalry games are what engage these fans the most. And it's also, we talk about momentum going into the, into the off season. You win your bowl game, sure, but to end your season finale versus your rival and do it five years in a row, it's hard to go into an off season with a bitter taste. Maria's down on the sideline with Dylan Thompson. Dilla, you know, you were announced that you're going to be the starter immediately after the season ended last year. How does this spring practice compare knowing that you're going to be on top of the depth chart? Uh, it's been good, you know, been able to put in some new stuff uh, with my guys and just having fun, uh, trying to keep the offense simple, but put in a few new wrinkles and we're having a good time out here. What were some of your main focuses coming into spring that you wanted to work on to improve your game? I want to be smarter. I want to take what the defense gave me more. Um, just like I said, just be smart on first down, keep us in manageable downs and distances, and uh, we're having a good time doing that. We talked to Connor. He said that he stays in touch with you. What are some of the conversations that you guys have had since he's left? Uh, we talked about his stuff, how he's training, and what, what I can do for my game to help me. Um, but he, he was a really smart player and worked really hard, and so he'll give me little nuggets, you know, to, to work on, and, and he's really helpful, and we got a great relationship. I thought it was interesting. Before the game, you said it's a little different because you're not expected to score the second that you go in, so you get to play with a little bit more ease. How do you put that into your game starting now? 
I just know every, every time I go on the field, we don't have to score that very first play. And I kind of felt a little pressure last year to do that, and I shouldn't have, but I did. And, um, and so here, you know, it's kind of just move down the field, keep getting first downs, and then we'll end up in the end zone. So that's what I'm doing. Well, you've been playing under Spurrier. You've got to have some good stories. Yeah. Can you give us your best so we can make the guys up in the press box laugh a little? Uh, Coach Spurrier, he, he, knows, um, he knows that I, I'm a Christian guy, so we always try to throw out Bible stories. So we got a receiver, Kane Whitehurst. So every time he talks to me about Kane, he's like, yeah, make sure you throw this to Abel. Abel, Kane and Abel. Like, typical old man Bible story. But every single day is something new with him. And he's always got, you know, some old joke. But uh, but he laughs real hard, and we, we enjoy it. Well, speaking of receivers, who do you feel that you've created a connection with, especially over spring, taking all those extra snaps? Um, it's going to sound really cliche, but all the guys. I mean, we, we stay after practice almost every day. Uh, Shaq, Demir, Nick, um, tight ends Jarrell and Buster. Um, Shamir, Jeffrey, Barrow, I mean, we got a lot of guys that, that are doing their job. And I think that's important, you know, right now to get that and work for the season, and we're doing a good job of it. All right, the first game of the season for you guys is on a Thursday night. SEC Network, Texas A&M's coming in. They've never played here before. What do you expect in that, starting in that big game? I think it'll, it'll be a good chance to show off our crowd. I think we have the best fans in the country. And um, just to show them what kind of a new era is like. You know, Connor's been here a while, done a great job. But I think it's going to be a, a different, different team out here, and we're going to have a lot of fun. All right, thanks for joining us, Connor. Thank you. Yep. All right, thanks, Maria. It's been an unseasonably cold uh, winter here. Obviously, it's warmed up now into the 80s. I think really everywhere it's been un unseasonably winterish. This is back in mid-February with one of the few snowstorms they got slammed with here. He didn't quit coming out to work out. This is with A.J. Can. He's got a vest on with a bungee working on those drops out in the snow. He tweeted this. I don't know what's more impressive, the fact that they're out there in the snow or that A.J. Can is rocking the tank top <laughs> on a snow-covered football field. Final play of this third quarter as Perry Orth chucking one through coverage incomplete. And we'll head to the fourth quarter with a running clock on the other side of this break. Dylan Thompson solid today in his first half of action in this Garnet and Black game. Maryland and Johns Hopkins have met on the lacrosse field since 1895. Ryan Brown not around for that one. He'll be around for this one today. We'll get you out there to Homewood Field as soon as we're done in Columbia, Joe. All right. Welcome back to the SEC on ESPN. The Johns Hopkins Maryland lacrosse a little bit like South Carolina Clemson football. Back at williams Bryce Stadium for the spring game here at South Carolina and for the most part mission accomplished mostly healthy through three quarters you mentioned Sean Carson banged up shoulder but other than that it seemed to be pretty healthy yeah a little disappointing to hear that of course Sean Carson having battled injuries throughout his career Brandon Wilds another guy last year missed a couple of games uh, due to injury well, I had Connor Shaw get banged up what you want to do is get work done in spring practice but survive it to where you can build in the summer camp Good adjustment on that ball. For Jody Fuller, first down to the 40, off of the throw for Orth for 22 yards. A little bit behind, and Perry Orth hasn't been entirely sharp, but perhaps what we've seen today is a continuation of what they saw towards the back end of the series of practices. Perry Orth came on strong, battling for that number two spot behind Dylan Thompson. He's had a little bit of difficulty getting enough velocity on the football and with the placement at times. Lofting one down the sideline, and he drops it in perfectly, reaching into the end zone for a touchdown. Matrick Belton for 41 yards. That one was more sharp for more. Great touch on this ball, though, and couldn't have placed it in a better spot. Lofting it just outside and over the head of the coverage of Demetrius Smalls. That's a well-placed pass right on cue. You call into question so far. What Perry Orth has been able to do with his arm, he'll walk on a guy that you know has gotten a lot of push as far as how he's been able to perform this spring. Whether or not that was a motivational tactic or not, that throw right there legitimized the fact that Perry Orth has had a pretty good spring camp. Perry Orth out of Florida. Came to South Carolina prior to last season after spending a year away from football, attending a junior college. Now the SEC Network coming in August. A 
of 2014. August 14th it launches. More than a thousand exclusive live events including 45 football games the first of which will be in this stadium on a Thursday night against Texas A&M. Go to get and tell your TV provider you refuse to miss out on the action. That's right. I like that. Just the belligerence. Yeah. Put the foot. Get it. Put the foot down. Yeah, I've had it for crying out loud. <laughs> I'm not getting off the phone until I get it. Look, this the stadium only holds 80 something thousand people. We can't all come to the game. I got to see what I'm saying. They've won 18 straight in this stadium, which is the longest active streak right now. now. Northern Illinois has won more games in a row at its home stadium, but Northern yeah. Illinois had a loss at Soldier Field and what the NCAA record keepers consider a home game. So they say that South Carolina has the longest home winning streak. They'll take it. Don't let the truth get in the way. Absolutely. Hey, man, if it takes a technicality, then so be it. That's Just right. as long as it's in your favor. Now, Northern Illinois, they should say they have the longest home winning streak. Well, they should. They but, should. But they can't because the NCAA said You're right. They can. And ultimately, they have the final say. Yeah. Brendan Nasevich battling for that number two quarterback spot. This is what he brings. Ability to talk and take off for first down. What have you seen in the number two quarterback battle overall? Well, you know, early on, I think that Connor Mitch acquitted himself very well. You know, I've already mentioned, you know, Perry Orth, nice throw there on the, on the previous possession for the touchdown pass. Uh, Nasevich, though, that element that he has with the running, I think certainly uh, separates himself a little bit just from a skill set standpoint. Now, that doesn't necessarily place him in that number two spot, but it does perhaps make him game relevant in certain situations to be inserted into the lineup. He's only three of eight throwing the ball. Mitch, seven of ten through the air, 108 yards. Thompson finished 8 of 11. Perry Orth, 6 of 10 for 86 yards and a score. We can keep in mind, you know, last season when we see Connor Shaw, he goes down early in the game versus Central Florida. South Carolina throws the football a good bit in the first half and then kind of ditches that game plan and realizes, look, let's hand it to our workhorse and Mike Davis, who goes off for three touchdowns and salvages a victory in Orlando versus the eventual <laughs> Fiesta Bowl champion. Uh, Central Florida Knights. So were it not for the ground game, which is still going to be intact this year, and as long as they can stay healthy, not only with Mike Davis, but Wild, Sean Carson, then I think that, that quarterback run element can be a little bit more diminished, especially if he's only going to get three or four carries in Dylan Thompson. You know, you might not have to get a rush attempt out of your quarterback. I think we only saw <laughs> one, maybe two series of Mike Davis today. He's taking it easy this spring. Don't want to get him banged up. Steve Spurrier saying this week that before he arrived at Florida, a year or two before he got there, Emmett Smith carried it 31 times in the spring game. He said, we don't do that Defensive here. pass interference, number 26, early contact, 15 yards, automatic, first down. Pass interference called on the defense. As clock continues to roll, we'll be back to finish it up on the other side. Got the great lacrosse action for you, Mike Chananchuk. At least one point in 33 straight games. He and Maryland taking on Johns Hopkins coming up here on ESPNU, Joe. All right, Matt, after that, Clemson spring game. Before that, over on ESPN, Florida State spring game. The defending national champ in a split squad, full 60-minute game. Jimbo Fisher and the guys really get after it down there for the spring game. Today on ESPN and on ESPNU. With Matt Stinchcomb, Maria Taylor down in the field, Joe Davis back in Columbia, South Carolina. Running clock here in the second half, running down near four minutes. Brendan Nasevich has not been sharp throwing the ball. And looking at a fourth down and 15 here. It gets one on one coverage with a fourth and 15 and drops it in. 
Sean Odom, a sophomore from Orangeburg, South Carolina, goes for 40 yards to keep the drive alive. I love it. They go right back. Sean Odom almost yeah. caught the ball on a ricochet on the yeah. previous play. They go right back to him. Perry Orth and now Nasovic showing some nice touch along the sideline. Nice concentration as well, hauling the football in, maintaining that possession and getting your offense into scoring position. Nasovic pulls on first and goal. Let's see how they call it. Official gets wiped out. I think by the standard that's been set in this that game, the large the amount of the two. Yard line. <laughs> it's a proximity tackle. Yes. So there was a defender within the area. So because of that, that's considered down. Nasovic, as we mentioned, and as you mentioned, Joe, you know, hasn't been very accurate in his passes. He's turned some receivers around, been a little late with some throws, but that's the piece that he brings. Now, if he can develop that passing capability, then I think it narrows the gap with what South Carolina currently has with Connor Mitch, who I think, frankly, after today, looks as if to be the second team quarterback. 32 on the carry. Runs Bryant inside the one. Third down and goal. Steve Spurrier, huge go. golf fan, went down to Augusta on Thursday. Have a pretty good idea what he's going to be watching tomorrow. As Masters comes down the stretch. I thought you meant, I didn't know if that was a recruiting dead period, maybe checking out some spring football in the high oh. school area. Oh, that. I understood, yeah. Yeah, that too. Short here, so fourth down and goal. Augusta only about an hour and a half from here. It's crazy how many people spill out into Columbia that are attending the Masters. Uh, the hotel was slammed, not just with South Carolina fans. A lot of these folks probably live within driving distance. Some of uh, some of the golf fans from across the pond made the trip over, staying here in Columbia. They say as far away as Charlotte, North Carolina, but wow. You know, obviously that's a, a diversion from the true passion in this part of the country, which is uh, the sport that we're documenting here today. Fourth down and goal. Nasovic keeps and gets hemmed in. So the defense comes up with a stop. Nasovic on the keeper. The SEC Network, we remind you one more time, kicking off the college football season. Thursday, August 28th. Coverage begins with Tim Tebow and the SEC Nation crew live from Williams Bryce Stadium right here in Columbia. And the Gamecocks open the season at home against Texas AM. Temple and Vandy following Nashville. Of course, the network launches on August 14th. You go to getSCCnetwork.com and tell your TV provider you refuse to miss out on the action. So the clock rolls down to a half minute to wrap up spring practice for South Carolina. What do you think moving into the summer and into the fall? Well, you know, everything that Coach Spurrier was touching, touched on, I think we've seen manifested out there today. And, you know, we spoke with Dylan Thompson. He's clearly keenly aware that he just needs to be himself. Nice play coming across there as the ball played in the end. Hate to see a player with a win knocked out of him in the final play, but good to see him. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Good to see you, James. Yeah, coach is saying, let's get out of here before something crazy happens here at the wire. But I think he's got to be pleased with the spring game, but certainly spring practice in general. The South Carolina sits poised to build on the excellence that they've established here the past three seasons. So the spring game comes to a close. Steve Spurrier happy about what he saw this afternoon in Columbia. We'll send you to a break. Studio will have it on the other side.